All right. So um, welcome everyone to this webinar. Um, and it's looking at how small grant giving can build the good food movement. So uh, my name is Andrea Gibbons, uh, and I'm the network coordinator um, for Food for Life Get Togethers. So I am a good person to follow up with if you have any questions or want to connect with anyone after this event. I uh, shall have my email from the invite. Um, so we're in the third year of our grants, our small grants program, and it's been a really key part of sort of the Get Togethers work because it's really been about creating a small, easily accessible kind of um, pot of money to support individuals and groups to run activities and events around the country that bring people together through how we grow, access, cook, and share food. Um, and so, and in some ways it's as simple as that um, because that in itself is, is like great. And we've done some, we've seen some really great things which you'll hear about. Um, but also just to say that this is also part of kind of the wider work and the, and the movement of the Soil Association, um, which is really about transforming our relationships with food and each other. And so it's, it's, it's like really working to think about how we can transform um, and shift food systems that we know don't work <laughs> into ecosystems that are good for people, place, and planet. Um, so we started, and um, I think Claire will talk more about this, but we started with 30 in our first round that took place in October of 2019. So that feels like, you know, that was like in another different world, um, but we've like, we're up to um, over, I can't, I, yeah, actually I meant to look at the numbers, but um, we had hundreds in the last round. So. Um, over 300, Andrea. Over 300. So yes. Yeah, so, so it's just been this this huge this huge growth um, of the grants, and and it's been so exciting to see kind of what people have proposed and what they've brought to life um, through this. So yes, yeah, so I'm I'm very excited about this panel and, and hearing more from from Matt. Um, uh, and they're kind of the the report. Actually, I'll put the link in the chat. We just got it up on the website like 10 minutes ago, so that's exciting. Um, so. Um, so we have a panel today that will open with Matthew Jones, who's a professor in public health and community development at the University of West of England here in, in Bristol, who's been working with us from the beginning, I think, um, to do the evaluation work, um, along with Sarah Hill, Sandy Smile, and Sarah Beadmore. And, and we'll also hear from Claire Hadway-Ball, who uh, is our um, grants and partnerships manager, and Don Page, who um, herself received a small grant and did great things with it, and he's going to tell us a little story about that. And, and then finally a response from Jill Wallen. Um, I totally probably didn't say that right because I'm American and it's Welsh. Um, I apologize. Um, policy and research analyst from the People's Health Trust. Um, so we'll have some time for Q&A, but again, feel free to, um, to put any questions you have in the chat. Uh, and also if you haven't introduced yourself yet in the chat, that'd be great to hear from you. And so I'll pass it over to Matt now. Thank you, Andrea, and good morning, everybody. Um, let me just get my screen share up and running. Is that working? Great. Yes, we can see it fine. Yeah, thanks. Super. So it's great to be here this morning. Um, we've been doing a bit of research more generally on, on the subject of, of small grants or mini grants or micro grants. Um, they're quite interesting things and um, lots of agencies are involved in um, offering them and thousands of organizations receive them and small community groups. Um, but they're often not, not, not that well researched when we started looking into them a bit more. And there's, there's lots of great things that they can do, but also, you know, are, are, are they limited and could they even be exploitative on occasions? So small grants are really quite interesting. And we're going to zoom in today just by looking at the, um, uh, the Food for Life Get Together's program and um, their small grants and focus particularly on one initiative, which um, was the Cook and Share grant. Um, and that was uh, offered through Food for Life Get Together's uh, 150 pounds, where groups were invited to deliver cooking and sharing activities that would bring people together particularly from disadvantaged and diverse communities with a view to reducing loneliness and social isolation. Um, so the food-based events were also intended to promote um, positive attitudes towards uh, other aspects such as um, issues around age ageing or diversity. Um, everything clustered around um, Cook and Share Month, which is uh, from October into November in 2021. Um, but there's also encouragement for organisers to run events on a longer term basis. So essentially what we were interested in was how did these grants help 
stimulate community action? Um, and how did they promote the value of good food? Um, so um, just to kind of give a bit of a flavor then, so we, we did the research with them, um, all 153 grant recipients. Um, we, we followed up um, three months later with um, uh, surveys of which about 88 responded. And then we had um, almost 20 interviews with specific grant holders to find out what they had been engaged with. And I think one of the first things that really hit us was, was just the sheer diversity of, of the different things that um, people were using their uh, awards for. So for instance, in, in Wirral, there was a project to make um, cheap and nutritious meals that are at 35 pence or under per portion, um, which obviously very timely in the context of um, you know, the affordability crisis that we're going into now. Um, another, another scheme in Sunderland was um, a multi-team challenge to create um, the best dish they could possibly do in 45 minutes with an emphasis on keeping food waste down to a minimum. Um, another scheme in Bolton brought together members from several different uh, ethnic uh, national communities together to, to share their finest culinary traditions. These events were often quite substantial occasions um, from an average of about 40 people from, from 10 up to 400 in one case. Um, and while there were multiple generations often involved, um, uh, another feature was that they, uh, people from a wide range of backgrounds took part and um, people living with mental health issues, long-term conditions, people on low incomes and other forms of health and social uh, disadvantage. Um, and, and to help the money stretch, uh, one imp impressive thing was applicants detailed uh, quite extensively what, what they wanted to do with the money. So for instance, in, in one quite exceptional case, the, the applicant uh, itemized each ingredient from olive oil for £1.89 down to vinegar at 29 pence. That's what they put into their application. That's how detailed their, their thoughts were about what they wanted to do. Um, so even though it's a very small amount, it's, it's quite impressive to see what people were, had thought through from the outset. Um, and, and of course, this was all very timely. Um, uh, it came at a time just when the lockdown restrictions were ending and lots of community groups were coming together in person. So in some ways, the, um, the Cook and Share grant couldn't have taken place at a more opportune moment, um, just when well, people were wanting to, to come together. We were interested often it, it's it, it, this is something that's a bit overlooked is is who who wants to work with these grants what what were their motivations who what were their backgrounds what what kind of skills did they bring um and um i think one of the things that that really comes out is is that uh, alongside a desire to support good causes the personal benefits are important drivers for organizers. So that their own sense of personal bringing connections, um, opportunity to use their skills, feelings of achievement, recognition. Um, so um, as you can see from these two examples here, um, people who um, have, have life experiences um, where, they, where they want to bring, make use of their their, their experiences and also get something back for themselves. Um, so many people have, have gone through various life transitions. Um, they had a, a, life, a lifetime's worth of skills ranging from, from cooking skills in these cases to, to administrative or people skills. Um, it, these were also events where people had a chance to express their personal values, their, and, and sometimes their ideological outlook, um, a desire to help others or a desire to address social and environmental problems. Um, and many people said that, that, that what took them into all of this was their experience of having taken part in these sorts of occasions and felt that, that it's something that they wanted to do themselves. 
um, the, 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 the uh, feedback that we got from the organizers was, they felt very positive about, about what they had achieved. Um, nine out of 10 stated that the events had helped improve the quality of life of participants. Um, six out of 10 that, that the events had helped create improvements around attitudes towards aging and diversity loneliness and so forth and, and almost everyone believed that the events were were successful in bringing people together so maybe in a sense that this was a, an example of a of a grant that's well conceived it's it's it, it resonated with people and um people felt that it was achievable within the within the, the money that's available one of the things that, that comes up with with um small grants is um who who might we most want to get these grants to? Who who who's going to benefit most? And um, often this is a, a, a the perfect sort of um, funding opportunity for someone who's really very new to the world of of ever having um, asked for funding, and and the idea perhaps being that that this is then a stepping stone for them. It's a it's a basis for going on to do further things. Um, and um, what we found, and, and we did a statistical analysis to see what the relationship between the skills of people and their sort of their, their background experience and, and what they wanted to achieve. Um, so certainly first timers reported back that they were gaining these kinds of basic skills. But there's another kind of aspect here that um, we know from small grants programs that there's also lots of applications from people who do have um, a lot of expertise in, in grant filling in um, for the applications. They've got lots of expertise in running projects. Um, and sometimes funders think, well, maybe they're not the people that we want to be receiving these grants. You know, they, they could probably do it themselves. Um, but, but I think what was interesting is that if you think about it like a sort of uh, a ladder with steps on it, um, what we found was that those people with more experience were able to make use of that grant to take them a bit of a step further so to grow their capabilities around um, more ambitious goals um, often they're, they're really good opportunities these small grants because they're quite open they're not that in this case the the grant scheme wasn't that prescriptive so people were able to kind of if you like, just just kind of reach out and step and take things a bit further, um, and and that was written into the into the grants very much with an idea of well, what 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 haven't you done? What do you want to do next? What what's something new for you? So in that sense, um, if you think about it like a ladder, um, small grants uh, can work for people at various different stages in their sort of um, aspirations to do community organising and community work. Um, and almost all organisers in, in, our, in our survey said that they were interested in running events after and, and showed and then reported how they were doing so after, after their first event. So this was really what was happening after the grant. Um, uh, they, um, they also talked about the benefits that extended beyond the funding of the initial grant period. Um, a, an, another example about, about this kind of aspect of what happens next is that um, almost half of the, well actually, sorry, over half of the organizers said that they wanted to make additional changes to what they'd done. So they'd run an event. Um, this is how they felt it had gone. And, and so they wanted to kind of make some changes, make some improvements. And so that kind of motivation to, to, to go on and do further things was, was clearly evidenced with a, a good fraction of those people. Um, and so it's not just always about doing the same thing again or, or, or doing things as, as usual. Although it has to be said that in this case and, and what you find with lots of other grant schemes is that um, rather than being like a sort of escalator onto new things, the, these grants are often sort of travelators. They, they keep people going along um, 
and and that's particularly the case when when you think about a lot of um small groups that are that are struggling to simply keep their heads above water um so small grants can realistically can can simply just keep people going um and and that's important i think for for us all to be realistic and recognize what what they can be achieved um having said that there's you know we we had some really interesting examples of cases where um they're almost kind of the ideal case where uh recipients of the small grants felt um so inspired that they went on to um, uh, reach out and start thinking about applying for more funding. So it was a, a good boost to, to uh, some of the organisers in terms of their confidence and their sense that what might be achieved and what's, what's doable. Um, another angle then we wanted just to look at was, was about um, how do these events work when it comes to food? Um, and, and I think that this was a, a, an interesting aspect that the, the cooking and aspect, the sharing aspects appeared to be very powerful connectors for everybody involved. Um, maybe some of that was, seems to be because food-based events do allow social interactions to be less threatening, more fun, more relaxed. Um, and um, when, when wanting to bring together people from diverse backgrounds, some of whom um, are not feeling confident in those kinds of social environments, food is a good way of bridging, um, reducing people's social anxiety, helping people make conversation, swap points of view, finding out about others, helping out in little ways, there's often lots of things to do at these kinds of events, um, and coming up with other ideas for other things that might be done. So food is a, is a really good vehicle here for, for oiling the wheels of, of, of community engagement. Um, uh, there are, of course, other platforms on which you can bring people together, but the, there's something really interesting about food here. Um, and um, the, uh, the, the other kind of aspects was, was about the, the meaning of food. And, and in this rather complicated bubble plot here. We, we categorized all the ways in which people were talking about food and, and what it meant for them. Um, and um, the, the basic kind of message that, that's here in this slide is, is that um, uh, people had a very wide range of ideas about what food could do and what food was about. So about environmental issues, about um, making connections with the local um, food producers in the local food economy, about um, matters of, of culture and celebration, um, as, as, as vehicles for learning and education. So food means a lot. Um, and uh, I suppose an interesting example was uh, food and community in Totnes, Devon, that prioritised fresh and locally sourced food um, on the basis that participants on low incomes deserved the highest quality food as a matter of respect and dignity. So some of the projects were very clear about the, the sort of standards of what food should be in these environments. And particularly then when working with people on low incomes, there's, there's, a, there's a question there about, OK, you know, what, what is a kind of um, the right way to celebrate? How do you bring people together? Um, but there are sensitivities about food as well. Um, because people have got many different points of views about what, what makes food good. Um, and so many organisers talked about how it's a priority to give participants an opportunity to, to make the decisions about what they wanted to cook and what they wanted to eat together. So um, that kind of decision making aspect, the, the run up and the preparation was, was felt to be really important in terms of how to make things work. So as you can imagine, we, we were kind of lucky enough to be talking to people from um, right down in the tip of the southwest of England and up to the north of the Shetlands and um, people who, who, who were doing this as a practical um, thing and, and making, making events happen, often on a shoestring. Um, and um, so we wanted to know what they had to say about, you know, 
what, what would they recommend to others? Um, and, and there were, this was often where people had, had um, the, some of the, some really great ideas and were very keen to share what their insights were. And of course it does depend upon what the projects are and what people are doing and what the, the goals are. But, but some of the themes come out um, that very strongly around a lot of emphasis on how do you spread the load of the responsibilities? Um, and then how do you keep events unpressurized and relaxed? Uh, and how do you keep things simple? Um, so the, there were some kind of real strong themes that came out there. Um, and there are two angles on this. One is that um, there's a question about setting up an event um, and how, how, you get, how you get something off the ground. Um, and here people reflect a lot about the, the importance of just doing the groundwork and the preparation, um, really understanding the interests of the people that you want to bring together. It sounds obvious, but um, a number of people said, uh, that's that's something they wish they'd done more of when they were kind of doing you know doing the preparation they just wish they'd really kind of got got to kind of get a sense of of things um on the other hand people also said that uh you know sometimes you just have to you, you have to go for it and see what happens um and then there are lots of practical insights about things to do with um just the practicalities, you know, having having insurance where that's relevant, the training in place for um, food hygiene standards, um, safeguarding arrangements, all the sorts of issues that small informal groups find quite challenging sometimes. And about um, some solutions that some of the groups had was just finding the right umbrella organisation to go under so that some of that kind of that, that those aspects could be helped with by, by having a, uh, an overarching uh, organisation that could assist with some of those kind of practicalities. Um, and then there are, there are things about how you, you deliver the events and how you make them run successfully and how to keep them going, most importantly um, for many people. Um, and again, that those themes of keeping things simple keeping things manageable um, really, really came up. Um, and th there's quite a lot in here about those kinds of, um, how, how, how as an organiser do you deal with when things don't go as expected? Um, and um, uh, people had some horror stories of things that they wish had gone differently, um, as well as some, you know, accounts of then how, how they had, um, you know, decompressed afterwards and, and kind of um, gone well it was it you know it, at least it went in this way um, and and asking people what they felt and often um, the feedback was great and and was a real boost um, it was also impressive that um, organizers often kept in aspirations um, so um, sometimes these small groups are are felt to be like um, little cliques, you know, people who, who are the same kind of background who just stick together and they just want to have some money to kind of do what they want to do. But the overwhelming majority of people were very clear that they were actually keen to reach out, to find new people to keep the events lively and fresh and, um, you know, with new ideas. So um, tips on, on just kind of not settling with the same old format was something that came out really strongly. So we'd, I'd like to thank um, uh, everybody then who, who took part in, in, in our, our work um, but, and gave their very generous time. Um, you, you can see that, um, that, that, that we certainly got a lot out of it and felt that there was a lot to share from what, what the accounts of, of people's experiences were. Um, so there, there are two reports that we've got. One, one is a short one for those who are short on time, but there is a longer one as well, which has, has lots of detail and lots of case examples of, of the many different things that people manage to do, often in very creative ways about how to run different kinds of um, events on, on a shoestring. 
So thank you. I'm going to close my slides now and um, hand you back to Andrea. Thanks, Matt. Uh, that was great. Uh, that was really interesting. Um, so I will hand over now to Claire uh, to talk a little bit from, from, yeah, about the program as we saw it. Lovely, thank you. Um, I just want to take a couple of minutes to share our learnings um, from creating a successful small grants process and give a few tips for anybody who is thinking of applying for similar funding. I'm just going to share a couple of slides with you. Um, Okay, sorry, that was the end of the presentation. Okay, um, so just a quick overview of the scheme itself. So we were giving out £150 grants for communities to cook, uh, so sorry, grow, cook and share together across three events over the year. Um, our plant and share event at the start of the year, the big lunch, which we have um, work in partnership with Eden on, and also the um, cook and share event that Matt just talked about. So um, we were using the scheme as a way to engage and reach new groups that we weren't working with. And at the beginning of the programme, um, to just mobilise communities to start taking action around um, good food. Um, uh, we found, so we started, so when we first started, Andrea already mentioned, we gave out 30 grants. And by the sort of final grant um, giving round, we were at, at over 300. So in total across the three years, we gave out 901 grants to different groups um, across the UK. So um, what we learned, this is mainly advice for funders. Um, so what we learned from actually creating a small grants process is to make the application form proportional to the amount of money we were, we were awarding. So as we were giving out 150 pounds, we kept the application form really simple um, and straightforward for people to complete. We also kept the terms and conditions short and used um, plain English and we adapted these as we went along, obviously making sure they were relevant for every round um, when we gave out um, funding. Think, um, thinking about accessibility is, a, is sort of something I would recommend. Uh, so we did offer people the, the choice to apply by video, but nobody actually did that. So I think in the future would think about um, like how to promote that more, maybe give advice to people who might want to apply by video instead of um, you know, a written application. We also use Microsoft Forms, which has a built-in screen reader, which meant that um, we could use that to check how accessible the form was before we actually started using it. So we found that really useful. Um, we um, created a short presentation, which we recorded to give advice to people who had never made applications before. And we also have a network of partners that we work with across the UK who gave advice and support in their local area to people who hadn't um, made applications before as well. But we would recommend in the future, um, or to, for anybody who was running a similar programme, for them to maybe have a Q&A, like a drop-in session online, because we found that we did actually receive quite a lot of email and um, phone queries. And sort of in hindsight, we wish we had perhaps run a QA and a um, so we could do all of that at one time. We also found it really useful to share examples of um, small grant holders work for inspiration. So we have a resource page on our website where we shared case studies and best practice examples just to give people little ideas and inspiration of how they might use their £150. Um, other advice is consider the onward user journey of unsuccessful applicants. So obviously anyone who receives a grant um, goes on to do their activity, but there were lots of people who perhaps applied and didn't meet all of our criteria, but they might have been able to actually get involved in other um, areas of our work. So for anybody thinking of um, giving out funding, it's just something to consider how you might get those people on board and perhaps in the future, they might go on to apply for future funding and carry on to do that good work. Um, we also found it really important, so as the, as the process evolved, when sending emails to successful applicants, to be really clear about our expectations, and again, try to make them proportional to the amount of money we're giving. So we were asking people um, to 
follow up with, with, around financial safeguarding and also evaluation. So we, we try to make that clear in the successful application email that we would be getting in touch with people and we would like them to get involved in evaluation and case studies where possible. Uh, we had a working group which we found really useful and it helped keep the process on track. So we met really frequently um, in the run up to any small grants going live and we used them as opportunities to assess what we'd what the work we'd done and to make amends um, where possible. That was a group of people from within our organization from different elements of from different elements of the program. And we used the plan, do and review cycle to make iterations and continuously improve the program. This was the first time like the soil association had ever given out grants. So it was really important that we kept reviewing the process to make sure it stayed relevant. Um, and then any tips, just to share some tips for those of you on the, the call who are thinking of applying for, for grants. I guess the first thing really, and the most important thing is to understand the needs of your community. So, you know, speak to people to make sure that what you're planning actually um, is something that they, they want to see and something they feel will be helpful. Get to know your funder. So just making sure your product, project actually meets the funder's criteria um, rather than trying to, um, you know, fit your project into, uh, sorry, yeah, so make, making sure it's relevant for that funder um, and rather than trying to sort of fit it into criteria where it doesn't really maybe um, fit sort of naturally. Um, check the terms and conditions and obviously make inquiries like funders love to hear from people if they've got um, questions and, and want to help those people so make sure you get in touch and then um, when you're thinking of actually making your application thinking about evaluation at the same time so it doesn't come as a shock kind of afterwards that you can plan that into to the event itself and make sure you're thinking of ways to measure successes and challenges um, and then when you're actually making your application I guess it's like reaching out to others in the community to check that application um, and, you know, more eyes, I guess, like bring a fresh perspective, make sure, making sure it's relevant and meets the funders criteria. And then when you're actually making your application, um, it's really great. The, the one, the applications we saw where they'd given stories and quotes or shared images with us helped um, bring ideas to life and helped, I guess, make us realise the impact that that work could have. So where possible, sharing stories and quotes is really helpful. Avoid using any general statements and give clear examples to back up what you're saying is we found like those applications a lot easier to kind of uh, assess. And then um, use the CAR method, which is context, action and results. So again, just um, sort of giving the context and the background to why you're running the event, the kind of um, activities you'll, you'll run and why you're running them and kind of the impact you expect to see and, and I mentioned already getting people to double check the criteria just to make sure the application um, meets the criteria of the funders okay that's that's that in a nutshell I'm just conscious of time so I, I want to hand over to Dawn Page from Fear and Hall to really um, bring to life kind of how far a small amount of money can go for a community group um, I'll just stop sharing my screen so um, that, that Dawn can um, take over. Thank you, Dawn. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm the Activities and Bookings Coordinator at Fear and Hall. Um, Fear and Hall is a community centre. We like to think of ourselves as a, a village hall, but actually we're in the middle of a quite a large town. Um, but we want to be a village hall. We want to feel, have that vibe about us. Um, in lockdown, we didn't get furloughed, we kept coming into work because the community needed somebody. They needed to talk. That we, we were meeting them outside on the patio, um, but people's mental health was deteriorating and we knew that when the lockdowns were finished, we needed something to do with them to bring them back. So I applied for this funding for £150 during the lockdown, while I'd been sitting on the patio, um, I met a lady who worked at Loughborough University, but she was a trained horticulturalist and she wanted to give something back to her community as well. So together, um, we decided that she would um, come and 
lead a group um, and teach people a little bit about gardening. However, we didn't have any money. We didn't know where to start. We had no tools for them to use. She, she kept talking about plants to buy, but I didn't know where the money would come from. So I applied for this funding and I thought, well, 150 pound will have to do. So we ordered the hand trowels and a few plants and some seeds and that got us started. Um, so we, we did some posters for advertising and we, we came up with the urban gardening group um, and people started to turn up on a Saturday morning. We, we, obviously the lockdowns had finished so our cafe could reopen and we offered them a hot drink. They were, we could also did English breakfasts and you know hot bacon cobs and things. So it, it was encouraging people to come out. Now, even if they didn't want to be inside the building, the gardening group felt quite safe. They were outside, not worried about COVID so much. So it picked up, people started to come. I mean, a couple came every week the, the elderly gentleman was in the early stages of Alzheimer's and his wife came along with him every week because he always loved gardening and they came and he couldn't even walk about so much so we put chairs outside and he would sit and plant seeds. Um, lots of people came and mum brought her son who had learning difficulties um, and so the equipment that we bought began to be used and the seeds starting, started to grow. We grew our, our own plants, we could put them in the ground and the, the back garden, which is what we planned to do, started to look quite nice. We then needed more, more soil. We needed more land to start gardening. Um, and there were six large tubs, about a meter square at the front of our building um, they've been there since before I came to work here, but they weren't really looked after. So the gardening group started to look after them as well. We put mixed in tomato plants and flowers and we just made them look nice. And because we'd gone to the front of the building, other people started noticing that something was going on. So it drew people into the building to find out. Um, we told them when the tomatoes were ready, just pick them and take them home. Um, and people started to do that. And then in the middle of the summer, I, I just had an idea. I don't know where it came from, really. I just imagined the old market barrows that they used to take round the old markets down London Way. And I thought, if I could get one of them, then the produce that we grow we can put out so people can see it, they can take it straight from the barrow. Um, but that idea then developed that we went to every allotment in Loughborough and we put a poster up on their gate saying, if you have excess produce, then we have a way of distributing it to the local community who, you know, they're vulnerable. It's an area of deprivation. They can't afford fresh um, fruit and vegetables so we had that way of um, distributing it now to find an old market barrow I mean some of them cost hundreds of pounds there must be antiques now but I found one it was in Cambridgeshire and somebody had had it outside their house on their drive for years and they were getting old and they were no longer gardening so from the Midlands, we drove to Cambridgeshire to pick up this old barrow. It hardly fit in the back of my car, but we brought it back. We had to tidy it up a bit. All the wood was rotting, but we did it. And we started putting that outside Fear and Hall on a Saturday. Well, all the allotment holders started coming down. They were dropping off, oh, I've got excess courgettes. I'll just put them on your barrow. Then they'd come in and buy a cup of tea. Um, and other people started being involved. People weren't just taken, but gardeners would take away um, a plant themselves and then come back and tell us that their plant had grown tomatoes and things like that. In fact, I had, have an uncle up in Yorkshire and he grew 100 tomato plants from seed. And I, I picked them up from Yorkshire when visiting my family and brought them back 
put them onto the barrow and people were taking them away to grow their own. And it was lovely. They kept coming back saying, it's great. The kids are loving it, growing our own vegetables. Um, and then the lions, the Loughborough lions, they heard about what we were doing and they were apple picking in about October time. And they said, can we bring you some apples? Well, they brought that many apples. We couldn't fit them on the barrow. So they were in boxes around the side, but everyone was took away um, by people who wanted them to, you know, whether they were eating them or, or turning them into apple crumble, but everyone went away. So, um, you know, we, we had this idea, it grew just because we had that 150 pound. We probably did spend a bit more than 150 because the barrow itself cost me 40 pound from Cambridge, but it was worth it. Um, so once again, we then decided we needed more space to be gardening in. So we spoke to the council about some really ugly amenity planting that had got big bushes um, growing in there. Nobody ever looked after it. And the council gave us permission to remove their amenity planting and turn it into a, an allotment. Well, it's, it's not a big piece of land, but it's, it's right next to the road. It's where everybody walks. And even now today, there's things growing. There's little signs in there saying, please help yourself. If, if something's ready, then please pick it and take it. Um, and people are doing, it's great. Even our cafe, they'll go out and pick a few leaves and bring them in and use it in the cafe at lunchtime. So that 150 pound, without that, I wouldn't have been able to start this because we needed a lock for the shed so that we could lock our equipment up when we bought it. But we're a community centre. We didn't have a lot of money at the time. We'd lost 80% of our income because of COVID. Um, so 150 pound just meant we could start something. And what we started back in, in Easter 2021 is still going today. That barrow was outside the door when I got here at nine o'clock this morning and somebody, I don't know who, had left some plants on it for other people to take away. So it's still going. And that's about it really. <laughs> Is oh, that enough? Amazing. Thank you so much, Don. Oh. The state of the world today and you hear stories like this and they just make me so happy. <laughs> so thank you. Um, I will pass over to Joel now to um, maybe have some reflections and then we'll, yeah, we are running short of time. Yes. Um, thank you to Matt, Claire and Dawn for some great presentations um, and to Andrea for the invitation. Um, so my name is Joel, I'm the Policy and Research Analyst at People's Health Trust. Um, we're a funder who focuses specifically upon reducing health inequalities um, and we do that by funding projects addressing social determinants of health. Um, so that's lots of small and local projects across England, Scotland and Wales. Um, I wanted to quickly go through what stood out in the evaluation to me um, and where I think small grant recipients can go from a really good platform. Uh, like this. Um, I mentioned social determinants of health a moment ago, um, and by that I mean those wider things around us in our communities. Um, so that could be the quality of housing, access to green space, uh, decent green space, um, the quality and quantity of jobs, whether there are things for young people to do, um, the standard of shops, and of course a big part of that actually is whether people have access to and can afford good food. Um, and these are things that are really influenced by where you're born, where you grow up, uh, where you live your life, um, and they're some of the main reasons um, for the huge differences that we see in life expectancy, the quality of our health, um, and for how much of our lives we can expect to actually remain healthy across the country. Um, and to us, that means that good health is a community issue, um, not just an individual one. Um, so I was asked to give the views of a funder here today, um, one who didn't fund any of the activity that's just been uh, talked through. Um, and I can see a lot of the really positive things um, that we see in our own investments in this evaluation, um, that when people get together with a common purpose and a shared goal, some really great things can happen. Um, we've seen that almost all of the get togethers lead to subsequent events, which is amazing. Um, I think when considering this alongside the large quantity of first timers who are getting involved, um, it really demonstrates the potential of community led movements with a bit of seed funding. Um, the evaluation makes it really clear that get togethers are really powerful connectors to um, building those crucial social connections, um, combating people's anxiety. Um, I think it points to a really positive sense of neighbourhood level belonging um, as well. That drive to do something, you know, the want to get together, 
um, the ability to bring people together. Um, it's community spirit, really. Um, and it's people building their confidence and their skills together collectively. Um, so we have a long term uh, medium sized grant program ourselves, um, which spans across various neighborhoods and enables residents to take action on lots of uh, things and put on lots of different activities um, as suits their local needs. And lots of those activities actually start with similarly sized seed grants um, for groups of residents to go ahead and test out what they want to do and to get comfortable leading it. Um, and it so often proves to be a really great exercise in the spread of control. Um, it builds confidence, it develops skills, um, it promotes leadership development, um, and it really develops a strong sense of purpose in those who are involved. Um, there was a quote earlier in Matt's presentation actually, which said, we can do this, we can fundraise. Um, and I think that captures it perfectly, those, that sense of tangible achievement, um, you know, motivating the people involved to move forward. Um, and actually we know from wider evidence that building control, especially when people do it together, um, is really conducive to better health and well-being. Um, strong feelings of control and actually having control, so perception and reality in a sense, um, it can lead to higher levels of life satisfaction, lower levels of anxiety, um, a greater likelihood that people find the things they do in their lives are worthwhile, um, which is really valuable. Um, we also know from the work of Michael Marmot, who you may have heard of, particularly his Whitehall studies, um, that that level of control we have over our work and by extension our lives actually can affect our mortality. Um, so the less control we have in life, the likely we are to have higher blood pressure, um, underlying illnesses, including cardi cardiovascular disease. Um, and I think, you know, activities like this that build control are really positive to see. Um, and I think at the seed scale, we can see this in these get togethers. Um, it was really great as well to see that they reach people with mental health issues, with long term health conditions, um, people on low incomes, because these are groups of people who often lack um, agency and can feel disempowered. Um, we work with lots of these communities ourselves and that impact of overcoming isolation of, you know, building connections and feeling that life is more worthwhile, um, has a greater sense of purpose can be absolutely enormous. Um, it can make such a huge difference. Um, I guess the only thing is small grants, um, much like the ones we give, will always lead to the question of, so what comes next? Um, and I guess beyond these benefits, which can be fantastic, we do have to be honest that uh, these events and these investments, as with the investments that my organisation makes, um, they have to be part of a larger ecosystem. We know that charities and voluntary groups across the country are stretched thin, um, that the workers at lots of community groups are facing serious levels of burnout from soaring demand, um, the consequences of a decade of public service cuts, a pandemic um, and now surging inflation um, that's pushing people to choose between their gas and food bills. Um, we saw an amazing national food strategy review published last year, uh, which addressed food and climate issues, riding, rising food insecurity and food bank use, um, the nutritional gap between rich and poor, um, but its implementation hasn't yet happened. Um, and I think the thinking about wider systems change that can support progress on food um, and other entrenched issues is starting to come forward and we are starting to see it, but voluntary and community groups and um, communities can't solve these issues alone. I mean, there's been a rise in food bank use from what, 60,000 parcels in 2010 to 2.1 million this year. Um, we know that the poorest households need to spend almost three quarters of their disposable income on food um, to meet the NHS's eat well requirements. Um, these aren't things that charities can do alone. Um, and to meet the size of these challenges, we need not only for local groups to keep up their amazing work, sustain the work as so many get togethers are doing um, and be the examples of how things can work in practice. Um, but if we accept the food system doesn't work for everyone, um, local groups with these positive examples of work under their belts can actually be part of a wider drive for collaborative work with local councils and push them to do more and push them to do better. Um, groups that really understand and represent their communities, um, like the one Dawn talked about hers, um, it's, it's really possible um, to push to ensure that people who are experiencing the hardest impacts of the cost of living or from the pandemic have a voice that's listened to in the design of the services that affect them. Um, and actually decision makers welcome that. Um, you make their lives easier. <laughs> um, it's clear that we need central government to develop policies that have greater investment for you know, things like free school meals, for community provision, um, and a clear national plan with targets for longer term change. But there absolutely is a role, especially at the local level, um, for community groups to go on and push for better and to influence real change. Thank you. Oh, that was great. Um, got a lot in in that short amount of time. And thank you so much, Joel. That was, that was yeah. um, I'm in. 
to the movement. Uh, uh, do we have any? Yes, yeah, so I'll just open it up for questions now to see if anyone's got any questions for any of our speakers. Um, it'd be great to hear from you or just thoughts about what you've heard and maybe your experience. Um, feel free to come off mute um, or raise a hand or put it in the chat or however. Um, I had a question for Don, like I had a question for Don about um, about kind of what this like, that you went and spoke to the council and was were successful in getting them. Like how how did that go? Did, was it was that a difficult experience for you? Had you done that before asking them for support? Like how? It wasn't me that asked, um, but apparently it was quite easy. Um, it, th that space outside with the large bushes, I mean, we, we have quite a bad drug problem and alcohol misuse problem in this area. So the bushes were a good hiding place. So the, the council themselves were, were quite happy that we took it down and it, it's now got strawberries and everything growing in it and rhubarb and, um, you know, it looks much nicer. The, the residents on the street opposite, they said, well, now you've removed the bushes, you better look after it, because I don't want to be looking at a, a rough piece of land. So we do look after it. And it's not it's not not me at all. I don't get my hands dirty. But, you know, we, we have volunteers now that look after these beds. I mean, there's other groups. Um, Loughborough University, there's a gardening society there. They come and look after a little bit. Um, there's an incredible edible group they look after a little bit so everybody's joining in with mm -hmm. the land that we created because of this grant so that's yeah, great so it's quite helped, easy has it helped you build relationships then with these other groups yes definitely that's yeah great. just this week the tra local transitions group they have their own allotment but they emailed me and said can we look after your middle planter outside because it's not looking very nice and I said yes come along and they they've put some beans in it this week and um they took the poppies out and they're they're um, drying them for seeds now as well so you know everybody's involved even the local cub scouts they they run from here on a monday and tuesday evening and they wanted a planter so the the young beavers could get their gardening badge so uh, lots of groups are now involved brilliant that's that's amazing um yes i think that for me that's another aspect of this isn't it that it's sort of brought different groups together that maybe not might not come otherwise uh, we do have a question in the chat i think it's for claire um what was the demand of the grants what was the demand for the grants in relation to the availability of funding so if we were oversubscribed yeah so um in the last couple of rounds of the grants we were oversubscribed so in the second to last round we actually shot early because we had so many applications for the amount of funding we'd allocated for that specific round that we had to close early. Um, so for the final round, we started monitoring at the level of applications much earlier so we didn't have to um, close earlier. And what we did when we started to sort of maybe feel concerned about the level of applications we were getting is we would start doing such targeted um, like social media campaigning, enable to like, I guess, to enable for us to, sorry, in order for us to not have to shut early, we just didn't promote it as heavily for the last couple of weeks. Um, I think in the last round, we got nearly 400 applications and we gave out like just uh, like 314 grants in total. But though the extras were, um, were basically uns unsuccessful because they didn't meet the criteria. So yeah, I guess if, if anyone's planning on giving out grants, I just another recommendation is just to monitor closely. Um, we did talk about trying to figure out like the percentage of successful versus non successful grants so we could start like to manage um our, our social media sort of uh, marketing a bit more closely but we didn't have enough like historical data because all the rounds have been like varying sizes of um funding available and also like varying popularity as well so that was really difficult i guess like if you could if you did that every single year over five years you'd have like more data to go on uh, Matt, I think you already come in on that. Uh, yes, just only to say that, that briefly that I think the it seems to show that often it takes a while for grant awareness to percolate and, and to and to filter through to particularly those people who 
who are not like looking around for grants all the time, who are not that experienced. So, I, I mean, I think I'd, I'd be really interested to talk to anyone who's been running a grants program that's a small grants program that's been going for a long time, because I, I, it does seem that uh, it, it would benefit to have grants programs that have the opportunity to, to just filter through in the awareness of people who are running you know small community organizations who can put the message out it, it, this all takes time and i think food for life probably found that in your first iteration didn't you that just getting the message out was you know the first job yeah we were so pleased with with 30 grant applications in the first round because we've never ever given out money before so for us to have like being able to give out 30 30 grants to people was brilliant and then obviously like it's evolved to become something much much bigger and um, so a last question were there any examples where food banks were involved in the projects i don't remember we yeah we would we would have had like i'm sure i can't think of any top of my head examples we could come back to you katie yeah. it's hard there were to lots of examples of food yeah. banks weren't there they they also come often were sort of hybrid so there were food clubs or community fridges or you know some way in which they 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 mixed what was interesting is that some i can think of examples where they wanted to not just give out food but um run events where people came together and you know enjoyed food together and learned about cooking and shared ideas and so forth so it, it, it formed a really good platform for expanding the kind of what we mean by what a food bank can do. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think I think we're like right on time. So unless there's any other burning questions, I think we'll just uh, wrap up there. And just a huge thank you to everyone who joined us today. And um, yeah, we will be um, following this up with an email with links to the big report and slides and recording and all of that. Um, yeah, and any questions, just feel free to be in touch. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Um, thanks. Thank you, Andrew and everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dawn. That was amazing. Yeah, just was that okay for you?